All right. Rosh Chodesh Sameach. All right. Welcome to Rosh Chodesh for the month of Harivi'i. Okay, the fourth month. All right. This is, for those who are not familiar with that month being listed anywhere, is because it's usually listed as Tammuz, and we'd rather call it Harivi'i, <laughs> um, which in Hebrew means the fourth. Okay, so this is the fourth month. Okay, so we're going to have our Rosh Kodesh service. Now, this is not a very long service, so welcome to all of you that are here, that are online, that are following live. If you're, this is the kind of service that if you miss... You know, if you're five, ten minutes late, you missed almost the whole service. It just, you got to learn to be on time for these services <laughs> because they're short. But then I may talk a little bit afterwards. Perhaps. Okay. All right. All right. So this is a service that is um, participatory. You guys are going to participate. We're going to read what's on the screen together. Okay. So if you're on the live stream, you're going to be doing the same thing we're doing here. We're going to be reading off the screen. And it's not very long, so we're going to ask you all to rise. We'll stand up for this. And we'll begin with the sounding of the silver trumpet. I mean, okay, so we'll all be reading off the screen except that one part where I announce officially the new moon. It'll say for the leader to read. Okay, begin with Psalm 51 and verse 15. Yahweh sefatai tiftach ufi yagid tehilatecha. Hold on, it's not on the screen for you guys? Now. Right, now it is. Okay, let's start again. <laughs> Psalm 51 and verse 15. Yahweh sefatai tiftach ufi yagid tehilatecha. Yahweh, open my lips that my mouth declare your praise. May the expressions of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart find favor before you, Yahweh, my rock and my redeemer. From Numbers, oh, sorry, this is from Numbers 10 and verse 10. Also in the day of your gladness and in your appointed times and in the beginning of your months, you shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings that they may be to you for a memorial before your Elohim. I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Kedushat Levana, the sanctification of the new moon. O Yahweh, our Elohim, and Elohim of our fathers, make this coming month one of good and blessing. Grant us long life, a life of peace, of good, of blessing, of sustenance, of vigor a life marked by a reverence for you and a dread of sin, a life free from shame and reproach, a life of prosperity and honor, a life in which love of the living Torah and the fear of Elohim animates us, a life in which our heartfelt desires are fulfilled for good. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, amen. He who performed miracles for our fathers and liberated them from slavery to freedom, may he quickly liberate us and gather our exiles from the four corners of the earth. And let us say, Amen. All right, the new moon of the month of Harivi'i is today. May it prove to be good and fruitful for all 12 tribes of Israel. May the set apart one, blessed be he, grant this Rosh Kodesh to us and to all his people for life and peace, for gladness and joy, for deliverance and consolation, and let us say, Amen. Together, blessed, praised, glorified, honored, and exalted be the name of the King of Kings, the set-apart one, blessed be he, who is the first and the last, and beside him there is no Elohim. Extol him in the heavens, Yahweh is his name, 
Rejoice before his face. His name is honored beyond all blessing and praise. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever. Let the name of Yahweh be blessed forever and ever. From Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I make stand before me, declares Yahweh, so your seed and your name shall stand. And it shall be that from Rosh Kodesh to Rosh Kodesh, and from Shabbat to Shabbat, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares Yahweh. Amen. Amen. Okay, Rosh Kodesh Sameach. All right, you may be seated. All right, you may be seated. Okay, so I'm going to keep looking this way, even though all of you guys are sitting over here. It's easier for the cameras. All right, so don't forget, as always, and I do remind us every, every time we get the opportunity, that this is one of those marking of time moments, right? We mark time. We mark time in terms of years. We mark it in terms of, actually, in a bigger way, in terms of jubilees and shemitahs, the 50-year and the seven-year cycles and the one-year cycles. Then you got your moon cycles, your monthly cycles, the week, the Shabbat cycles. You got your daily. You got hourly. I mean, just time moves, and we have lots of different ways we mark that time. And so as we mark time, I always encourage you that we should take the opportunity to examine ourselves as we mark the time. And what are we looking for? We're looking to see comparatively, comparing you not to anybody else but yourself, but comparatively how you are now compared to the beginning of that time cycle. And so we're looking now at the monthly time cycle. So look at yourself compared to where you were 30 days ago, basically, and see what kind of progress you've made or not. Okay, I want you to be encouraged and motivated by your progress. Some of you are thinking, but I haven't made any progress. Well, fine. Be motivated by any level of falling short. How can I be motivated by any level of falling short? Because it should motivate you to do better next time. Don't be discouraged. Don't beat yourself up. Be encouraged and then motivated by the falling short. If you're not where you I don't know which way I want to put this. If you're not where you want to be, think you should be, intended to be, etc., at this point, then you have to look at what is missing in terms of my motivation and my effort. Why am I still not where I think I should be? Now, it could be you're aiming at the wrong target. In other words, you're trying to bite off a little bit more of a leap than you should be trying to, you know, trying to make a bigger leap than you should, biting off more than you can chew, mixing my metaphors there. Um... But let's understand that as you look at time, there should be some things you notice you actually have done. None of you did nothing for the last 30 days. Okay, some of you went backwards a little bit in some areas and forward in others. But when you examine yourself, I want you to be encouraged by either one. Encouraged and excited about the progress you've made and continue to make you know, that effort to keep going forward. And then, of course, anywhere you fell short, use that as a motivator to say, I'm going to do better this time. Okay? This is really the key. See, I think that one of the things we miss is that in your scriptures, the reason we have a Bible, well, I shouldn't say the reason. One of the reasons you have the Word is that the Word is to motivate you. You read the Word and you see what people did, what they didn't do, but more importantly, what was expected and what they were motivated by to go forward. Of course, we're very, we're very much blessed to know that the motivation is eternal life. The motivation is the forever. The motivation is no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering. And of course, that's because we'll have overcome the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, which is what causes almost all of our tears and suffering either because of our own evil inclination or the evil inclination of others. And so I want us to be encouraged. So when you look at your falling short, though, like I said, one of the, chance, one of the possible reasons why you fell short was a, a target that was maybe not the best target. Maybe you weren't ready to go that far. So here's the process. I've given this before. I gave this actually, I think, for the first time when I was doing the first money class that I did. Not the one as part of the money 
mastery class, but this is a money class I did as part of the Up to the Challenge a few years ago at Sukkot at the YMCA or Passover at the YMCA. Passover, I think it was. And so I'm altering it a little bit to this idea of aiming at a target. You need to pick your target. That's your job, all right? You pick your target. I am aiming for becoming better in this area by this much by next new month, by the next Rosh Kodesh. So you pick your target. I'm going to take this part of my life that doesn't need to be there. I'm going to rid myself of it completely. This part I'm going to work on and get much better at. This part, you know what I'm saying? You're going to pick your targets, goal setting, whatever you want to call it. You're going to aim at something. Then you're going to get counsel and advice and guidance. You should have somebody you could go to and say, I'm picked, I've picked these targets. Do you think they're appropriate? Are they... Are they going to be reasonable in the time frame that I'm picking? What, and then guidance says that, well, then what do I need to do to hit those targets? Okay, so you're going to pick your target and then find someone to guide you and advise you and counsel you in the best way to arrive at your goal. Then you're going to create a plan with the advice that you get so that you can go ahead and reach that target, hit the target. Then you're going to work the plan for the period of time. In this case, we're talking about a month. And you're going to monitor your results, which is what I started with, right? Let's look back and see how we did. And guess what? Then you repeat the process. You start again by reevaluating based on your results whether or not the target was the right target in the first place. Maybe the target was perfect and you just didn't do very well at it, but there was nothing wrong with the target. Maybe you were a little overly ambitious and you need to move that target in just a little bit, make it a little bit more steps to get to where you're going. I didn't say get rid of the target, but just maybe, look, let's say your goal is, we'll take something simple that everybody would understand. Let's say your goal is to run a marathon. Marathon's 26 miles. Maybe you've never run, you know, ran a, you, know, you haven't even run a mile yet. But you want to run a marathon. No problem. I'm sure you can but your goal would probably not be to run that marathon the first time you run or the second or the third. You're going to have to build your endurance, your stamina, your physical capabilities up before you get to 26 miles. So if you're starting from zero, maybe setting the goal to run a marathon in the, after 30 days of getting warmed up and practicing and everything might be a little bit ambitious. Maybe being able to run five miles would be more ambitious, or 10 miles, maybe. You understand what I'm saying? So you'll get some counsel, you get advice, and that person might say, well, the problem is you actually picked an overly ambitious target for just 30 days. Not overly ambitious overall, maybe that's your six-month goal, but you made it a 30-day goal. And so don't miss any of the steps in here. You're gonna pick your target, you're going to get counsel, advice, guidance, whatever word works for you. It doesn't matter. And it doesn't have to be from someone like me. It's whoever you believe can give you because they've already gotten where you're trying to go. So this could apply in any area of your life, not just your spiritual life. Because, by the way, when I say it's a new moon, I wasn't talking about just measuring how much more Yeshua-like you are. You might have wanted to get your health to a certain place in, the, in those 30 days we just finished. You might have wanted to get your finances to a certain place in the 30 days. You might have wanted to get your social life to where any area of your life you may have wanted to get from where it was to a higher place in 30 days. And so whatever area it is, you should be talking to somebody who knows how to get and has optimally has already gotten the results you're looking for and then get some guidance and counsel. Create the plan, work the plan, monitor the results, and then do it again. Reset the target if necessary, or maybe the target wasn't the problem, so maybe we've got to create a different plan. And underneath all of this, underlying all of this, which is why you need to read your scriptures, listen to teachings, is the motivator. We only do what we want to do. We do what we don't want to do. If we don't want to do it, but we know we need to, we'll do it up to a point, but it takes a lot to keep us doing something we don't want to do. So then you got to work on the motivator. You have to figure out how to get yourself to the place where you want to do what Yahweh says. You want to do whatever it is that you just want. 
If you want your finances fixed and you don't want it bad enough, you're not going to fix your finances. If you want to get in shape because you have some, something you know, with your health you want to fix, well, you're not going to get that done if you don't want it bad enough. And so if you're struggling and you're looking back at the last however many of these you've, been, you know, you've done with me, and each month I say the same thing, and you're like, yeah, but I keep feeling like I'm not getting anywhere, and I, I want to beat myself up for being whatever negative thought you want to put in there. Well, maybe you should be focusing not on beating yourself up but figuring out what is missing in terms of motivation. Why don't you want it bad enough? All right? Use myself as an example. It's always the easiest thing to do, right? Use yourself. A lot of you, very publicly, I made this very public. A lot of you knew I was trying to lose weight for a goal, for a, a medical exam that I was going for, for something that I needed to do. And I set that goal, and I crushed that goal in the time frame I needed to. Oh, don't clap yet. Yeah, you're all excited about that. I then put 10 pounds back on because I didn't have a new goal and a new motivator to keep going. I hit my goal and said, good, I arrived. Went right back to a lot of the bad habits that got me in the first place. So I lost 25, but really only lost 15. I put 10 right back on. And it wasn't right back on. I went sideways for a little while, which even lulled me into a more sense of I'm okay, while the bad habits were accumulating to start to really bear fruit. Okay? And that's what you got to watch out for, too. Because you may not see the negative result right away when you start falling back into the habits that got you to where you were before that you didn't want to be. So let's be aware of that. And so where did I go wrong? Well, sometimes where you go wrong is you reach your target. Look, you reach your target, you need a new target. Now, by the way, let's say, for example, I'm just going to be arbitrary here. Let's say your ideal weight is 150, whatever it is, all right? And you reach it. That doesn't mean you have to set a new target lower than that. Now you have to set a target on how you're going to maintain that. What am I going to do in terms of my lifestyle to maintain that? Just like finances. Let's say your goal is to get out of debt. That's great. And then you get out of debt. And next thing you know, six months later, you're back in debt because you didn't set the new goal to make sure that you don't do that. So you still need these targets that you go for even after you hit the target because the target may be I hit a short-term target and I'm, on, I'm not there yet like when I was losing the weight my first target was to lose five pounds then 10 pounds so I hit those but I still had another target well once I got to where I was aiming which was my ultimate target at that time then the thing that you would naturally expect to happen happened I got complacent I went sideways and it went up it went the wrong way Okay? This can happen in your spiritual life, your financial life, your health, okay? Any part, your career, because I don't want to you know, say that your career and your financial life are necessarily the same thing. You may have enough money to pay all your bills and hate your career. I mean, it's not what you want to be doing. And so those, that's actually a secondary area. And so I want you to really be thinking about these things. You know, I might be doing a... Another finance class, maybe it's a code somewhere. I want us to start thinking about um, some of these things in bigger time frames. In other words, where should you be in these areas of your life when you, by the time you're 20? Well, then where should you be by the time you're 40? We'll do this in 20-year intervals. And then where should you be by the time you're 60? And where should you be by the time you're 80? Because nowadays, almost everybody makes it to 80. That's like very common. 80 is not that shocking anymore. I mean, you know, the, the lifespan is, keeps going up a little bit. And so, you know, what you do when you're 20 affects where you are when you're 40. What you do when you're 40 affects where you are when you're 60. And what you do when you're 60 is going to affect where you are when you're 80. But also what you did when you were 20 affects that too if you didn't fix it anywhere along the line. The further you go, though, there's more challenge in fixing it because you're running out of time and you've created more problems over time. I don't want you, any of you to think, oh, but I'm already so old that it's too late. No, it's not too late. It's just going to take a little bit more to do it. you got nothing else to do. 
I mean, seriously, what else do you have to do? You're alive, and while you're alive, you got this is what you have to do. Get your life as best you can to, to your best ability, right? <laughs> Nothing else to do. And so I had somebody the other day, we were talking, and they were worried about dying. They were talking to Elder Billy, and I heard this because the door was open. He does that on purpose at times so that I'll come running in at the right moment. And I walked up and gave that person the strongest encouragement I could. I said, you are dying, so get over it. They were like, what? I said, we're all dying. The person was afraid of dying. I said, but we're all dying. Nobody knows when it's actually going to finish the dying. <laughs> the question is, during that time that your body is going through this process that eventually leads into death, are you living during that time? And what are you doing in terms of living during that time between, you know, it's that little dash that's on the gravestone between the day you were born and the day you died. What are you doing in that little dash? Because that's the living part. It just gets relegated to a hyphen, right? Born 19 whatever, died 20 whatever. But wait, there's a little hyphen in the middle. That's, that's your whole life right there. And so... That's where the motivated by mortality thing comes in. Billy said, well, yeah, don't forget to mention that today. Look, we all know we have a limited time. We don't know how limited that time is, but it's limited time. Okay? As the great sage, you know, Jim Morrison once said, no one gets out of here alive. If you know who I'm talking about from the doors, right? He says, no one gets out of here alive. Only one ever did, and he even died and then was resurrected. Okay? And I know you're going to say, what about Enoch? What about Elijah? Look, that's a whole nother story. But we know it is given once, at least, right? It's given once for man to die. And so let's not worry about that part. What are you doing now? Okay, this is the beginning of the fourth month. And by the way, we start getting... It's like timing-wise, it's funny. Sometimes we, we have timing where certain months have a certain feel to them. Well, what's the next month? What's the next month coming? Av. What happens in the month of Av? All the bad things happen in the month of Av. Right? The spies spied out the land and came back with an evil report. The destruction of the temples, both of them. All kinds of horrible things have happened to the Israelites and Jewish people on the ninth of Av specifically. And so we start thinking of the days of awe and all these things that start next month. Well, what about this month? Every minute counts, and we waste so much of it. So I want to encourage you not to waste so much of it, but redeem the time, as they say. There's a lot of verses in the bread about that, you know, taking full advantage of and not wasting the time. Because you don't know what time you have. And certainly you know you've got a lot of work to do as far as working on all those areas of your life. Because I don't think anybody in this room or anybody even on this planet necessarily has everything in their life the way they want it to be. Certainly it's not the way it should be, whether they want it to be or not. Some people have a lot of their lives the way they want it to be, but it's not what it should be because they don't want the right things necessarily. And so let's take this moment in time, this time marking moment, to say, okay, I've got until the first of Av, I've got 30 days, roughly 29 point whatever days. And so in that time frame, what am I going to do now for the next month in all these areas of my life? And by the way, you probably should spend a good amount of time either right before the end of a month or on the first of the month thinking about that next month. Don't start thinking about this next week. You've already lost, you know, one-fourth of the month. <laughs> you want to figure this out like today. Some of you are thinking, yeah, but then tomorrow's preparation day and this and that. Well, but this day didn't sneak up on you. It shouldn't have. You should have known that the new moon was here. As a matter of fact, today is already the new moon, and so we're getting to the end of the first of the month. So he lost a day, more or less. But you guys, again, the encouragement part. He called you because you can do this. 
He called you and opened your eyes and popped your bubble and opened your ears and shared the revelation of his word and his truth to you in a way that you never had before, knowing that from that moment forward, you could get there. And some of you are thinking, no, I could have got there from when I started, but I've already blown. No, he knew you were going to do all that stuff. You can still get there. As long as you still have breath in you and can still make the decisions that are necessary to move forward, you can still get there. If, if you believe. But now you've got to believe in something that's really tough. You've got to believe in yourself. Okay? A lot of you struggle enough believing in him, but now what about believing in yourself? Well, I just don't think I can make it. Well, that's not going to get you there. You don't have to believe you can make it. You've got to believe that he believes you can make it. And then you can start believing you can make it. All right? Yeah, you can clap for that. All right? Rabbi Tom was trying to lead you in that. <laughs> I'll say that again. It's simple. It's very simple. You don't have to believe as long as you believe he believes. Then you'll get there. I just can't see myself. I can't. Well, but he does. And see, apparently you're not embracing that yet. You're still not believing that he believes you can do it. I say it, and you go, well, intellectually, I kind of I get that. Well, do you? Does it go beyond that you're thinking about it, that you're feeling it and embracing it and believing it? You know, hopefully, meaning you have the experience. Right? Knowing is a relational thing. You have an experience with the revealing of the word in your life. In other words, you see things now that you never saw before. You understand things now that you never understood before because of this thing we call the bubble pop, right? He opened your eyes. He popped your little delusional button, bubble, right? If you don't believe that that is a supernatural, personal popping of the bubble, then we've missed something. But you should know that because you talk to your friends and your family members and all the other people you know that are not bubble popped and they can't understand a word that you understand. You try. I know you do. You try and they can't see it. You share Shabbat, they can't see it. You share, you share Kashrut, they can't see it. You share the feast, they can't see it. You tell them about all these pagan things they're doing that's mixed into their belief system, they can't see it. Of course, neither could you until he popped your bubble. So you have to know that that's proof of an outside entity or power interacting with you. Because most of you, and I think maybe this is, I don't think I've ever said this before. You notice that he doesn't generally pop children's bubbles. So this way you had enough life to know that you were smart enough and educated enough and mature enough that, well, logically you should have been able to understand this stuff without the bubble popping. But because there is a delusion, because he has given us over to that, it requires a supernatural revealing. And that gives you some of the proof and evidence you need that he is. Think about it, okay? Some people are like, well, how do I know God exists? Well, I don't know. You couldn't do the math before where two and two equal four, but now you can. I mean, from a scriptural point of view. Because now you look at it and it's like, oh my gosh, it's so obvious and easy. It's right there. Well, where was that five years ago when you couldn't see it? And the key is you couldn't because you were given over to that delusion that the world is all under. And so it, it has to be embraced by you that what you have in your ability to see and understand is because he personally poked a hole in that delusion and opened it up so you could see the real world. You could understand the book the way it actually was written to be understood. That, if you can't get that far, then you're gonna struggle in all this stuff. In a sense, that was your coming out of Egypt moment. Okay, I don't think I've ever put it that way, but you were in bondage and slave to the delusion. And he revealed and freed you from that delusion to be able to see things as they really are. The good, the bad, and the ugly, but to see them as they really are. 
And that moment for Israel coming out of Egypt was to inspire them, right? So that they would be motivated to be what? The children of the living Elohim. To be the children of Israel, his chosen people. And then what does he do now in 2022? He's doing the same thing. He's, but he's bringing you out of a psycho-emotional Egypt. In other words, where we can't see and receive from him the way we need to and should because the, the enemy has given us a lie to buy into. Right? We have the verses like, our fathers have inherited lies. He's given us strong delusion. And this, that delusion is strong. You have lots of people that you know, including yourselves, and maybe some of you have had, you can even raise your hands, I'll, I'll just get a, I'm just curious. How many of you had people come to you to try to show you this stuff before you were ready? How well did that go? Because you weren't ready, right? Okay, that's, that's really important that we understand. A lot of times, somebody might have come to you and said, by the way, the same thing you would say now about the Shabbat and this and that and revealing all this truth, but you couldn't see it then. But now you can. Oh, by the way, it's progressive. Progressive meaning you've got the bubble and it puts a little hole in it and starts to open it up a little bigger and a little bigger and a little bigger, which is why if you listen to something I teach and then listen to it again two years later, you may hear a whole lot you didn't hear the first time because you weren't ready yet or able to receive the, all of it. And some of you are thinking, well, that's, you know, the new people listening. Well, this guy's all full of himself. No, it's his words. And so just like when you read the Bible and you read verses you've always read before and now you're reading it for the 50th time and now you're getting something new out of it that you never saw before, that's the way these teachings are. And you'll go back and tell me, I've listened to that teaching five times. So for whatever reason, I pulled it out again last week and I couldn't believe how much I never heard the first time or fifth time because you weren't able to receive it. Because your growth in the whole growing and the clearing away of the delusion takes time. By the way, you can speed up the process. Did you know that? Walk in what he shows you and it speeds up the process. Ignore the, what he shows you and, and you sort of stagnate with the whole staying small. Think about what I just said, right? The more he shows you and you do, you apply it, the more he reveals more. And if he reveals a little bit and you don't do anything with it, why is he going to give you more? To whom is given a little, he expects a little. To whom he gives a lot, right, he expects a lot. So he gives you a little first and sees what you do with it. Well, let's see here. Here's a little bit. Let's see what you do with it. And we got a lot of people out there not doing very much with it. You know? Oh, sure, they maybe move from Sunday to Saturday and maybe eat a little different, maybe. Okay? Because I know... I keep getting reports every now and then of people that should know better, you know, going into restaurants and ordering stuff that they shouldn't be ordering and stuff. Well, you know, that's not for me to judge. It just shows that they haven't fully embraced what they had revealed to them. See, if you don't relate, well, let me rephrase that. If you don't interact with the information and apply it, then it's just information. It's not actually what we would call knowing. All right? I want you to know something. That doesn't mean I want you to have information. I want you to take that information and apply it and know what that's all about. Experience. And maybe what Yeshua was saying is, get away from me, I didn't know you, is because you have not really experienced me. You experienced some phony version of what people claim was me, but you really haven't experienced me. You haven't interacted with me in the way I was designed to be interacted with, the way I intended. And then it goes sideways, and it doesn't work very well. So again, I want all of you to be encouraged. You can get there. You can do this, but you got to do your part. But you can do your part. I don't care how old you are. I don't care what your health is. I don't care what your education level is. Not a single one of you here is missing what's needed, or he wouldn't have popped your bubble, okay? You have all you need in terms of capabilities. You don't have all you need in terms of information that you need to start applying, but you have all you need in terms of capabilities. Now it's up to you to do what? To, to set the target, the kingdom, 
Get counsel and advice, teaching, instruction, etc. Create the plan of how you're going to transition from what you are into what he is. Work that plan. Monitor your results. And then repeat the process over and over again. By the way, that doesn't work unless you actually end up eventually with those five-fold guys in that counseling, advising, guidance place. Because that's why they're there. That's what Paul tells us in Ephesians 4. That they're there for the perfecting. To bringing you to this perfect level, eventually, that you've been aiming at. We're aiming at the perfect, aren't we? I'm not talking about ourselves. The target is Yeshua. He's perfect. So we have a perfect target. You can do this. But it's you that has to do it. Nobody's going to do it for you. And by the way, in saying all of that, please stop. In the emotional pull to judge others who are not where they should be either. Or you judge them because they're struggling. You're judging them because they're not doing, oh, they should know better. I don't know. How many things do you do that you should know better? This is why we have a plank and a twig parable. <laughs> See, the problem is they're doing something you would never do, which distracts you from the fact that you're doing things they would never do. But you think now you're a little bit, you know, elevated because you're looking at them going, I would never do that. Well, good. Instead of you should just look at them saying, I hope that they figure this out and straighten it out. I'm glad I know better and I'm not doing this. And one day they'll figure it out too. That's a much better way to look at it and approach it. All right? Because this body has got to find more levels of compassion in loving those that are not ready yet to really put in the effort. And some of them may never get there. We don't know which ones. And some of them may absolutely get there and we'll have been so hard on them and they got there. Some of them may end up in a higher position than you because they may really get it at some point while you're busy judging everybody like you think you've arrived already. You don't know. You should be praying that they all do. Remember, he says the wheat and the tares are not that easily identifiable. And they're growing up together. So he also says it is not your job to figure out which is which. And it's certainly not your job to try to uproot the ones that you think are the tares. And that is absolutely what it says. Well, it says, well, actually it says until he sends the ones who are supposed to do it. Well, that's not you. I can... Take that on very strong authority that it's not you. I've gotten emails from people thinking it's them. <laughs> Yahweh told me to contact. Over the 20 years, I've gotten plenty of emails from people saying, thinking that the creator gave them the role to go contact ministries to straighten them out. The role of straightening out ministries belongs to only one. Okay, and that would be Yahweh. It's not your job to straighten out a ministry. Now, well, what about the prophets, Rabbi? No, the prophets were sent to straighten out kings, not ministries. If a prophet was messed up, there wasn't anybody to send to fix them. Yahweh took care of it himself. So let's be careful with that, because i got a lot of you out there thinking it's your job to go ahead and contact your pastors from former churches and contact this and straighten everything. It's not your job. The ministry belongs to the Almighty himself. Those that are claiming to represent the Most High are the responsibility of the Most High. And he's going to cause or allow anything he needs to cause or allow with them. Pray for them. Because after all, now you're talking to the only one that has any real authority over them anyway. Because you certainly don't. And shouldn't. Because in the vertical whether they're appropriate or false, where they are, their claim to be in that vertical means that they are beholding to the one above. Okay? And let's make sure that we're doing that because we've become a very, very, I don't know the right word, intolerant body. Very, very intolerant. And it's funny because people, I think, accuse me of that, but if you talk to Elder Billy, you find out that I have a lot of tolerance, okay? Maybe it comes across like it, because i got to be really strong with you guys to make sure you know where the boundaries are and where you're supposed to be trying to put those boundaries. But I allow 
almost anything because it's not my job to get in there and, and stop, unless whatever's happening is directly affecting the people in this congregation. It's not for me. If I find out that any of you are going out to restaurants and eating things you shouldn't eat, I'm not going to say a word to you. That's up to you to figure that out. If you come to me, I'll give you counsel with it. Because people come to me and say, oh, so-and-so is this or so-and-so is that. I'm like, okay, that's their journey, their walk. Now, if they're trying to convince you to do it too, I might say something. Do you understand the difference? All right? But yet, we're so... We look at what people post, especially on Facebook, and we read everything we can into them, and then we want to just get very, very strong. And you contact me, and I'm always like, I always say the same thing, and Billy could tell you, what do you want me to do? And the person isn't expecting that. They're figuring they're going to just tell me, and I'm going to do whatever. I said, well, I always ask, well, and what is it you want me to do? What are you expecting me to do? And then they don't know what to say because they don't know what they want me to do. Because when they think about what they really want me to do, or they realize this, it's not going to sound so good when it actually comes out of their mouth. It sounded okay in their head, especially if I'm the one doing it. But to say it out loud, well, I want you to, and they're like, no, that will sound really horrible. That'll sound very immature. That'll sound very intolerant. It won't sound very Yeshua-like. certainly won't sound like it's filled with the Ruach. But Rabbi, how could you allow? Do you know, listen, pay attention. You ever hear of the thing called the flood? What happened before the flood, though? Yahweh allowed the entire world to go to whatever, okay? He allowed it. He allowed them to turn into this generation where he said that all men, basically, except for Noah, their minds run evil continuously. Now, you're thinking, as a father, as a parent, shouldn't he be in there smacking them around somewhere along the way? He let them do it, just like he's letting them do it today. Oh, no, but Rabbi, you need to stop them. <laughs> I need to do what's necessary to protect you if what they're doing is an attempt to influence you to do what they're doing. If they're just doing, that's their problem. Not mine, not yours. But, but, stop, but, but. You know, we got people out there posting how much they love the new places that they've gone when they've left here. Well, good. Let them be happy. Why? You, what's that a problem for you? Oh, well, but you know, what do you mean, but you know? Don't you want them to be happy wherever they're going? I mean, after all, they're going somewhere. Let them be happy. It's their journey. Why does it bother you? Oh, we think this guy's so great now, and this, so what? Especially if they didn't throw the little extra kick at the end, like, and he's so much better than our former place, or at least he's this or that. Well, you know, even though they may, you know what? You don't need to defend me either, okay? You don't need to defend me. There's nothing about that. I'm doing a job. Other people out there are doing a job. Yahweh will decide who's doing the right job. He's going to draw whoever to wherever, Stop needing to be involved in all that as far as straightening it out or standing up against or whatever. Okay? There's, there's no need for that. That is not Yeshua-like behavior. Yeshua sat down and had lunch with the publicans. If you guys were there, you'd be throwing rocks at them. What's wrong with you? Don't you know those are publicans? Those are, those are the tax collectors? Those are the sinners? Why are you over there? And then they would, oh, and back in Yeshua's day, they would post on Facebook a picture with selfies with Yeshua. Look who he's eating with. Can you believe he was with those guys? <laughs> this is, you guys laugh, but this is where some of you are. <laughs> Emotionally. And you're like, doing this stuff. Guess what? It's a new moon. What does that mean? Let's make an attempt and a commitment not to do this stuff anymore. Right? We're going to struggle against it and stop doing these things. Amen? All right. Okay, so that's going to cover for what I want to say. Does anybody want to say anything? Do you want to make comments, questions, or anything about all that? Okay, because we do have a mic. Where's 
Okay, Rippy's got the mic right here. So if you want to stand next to Steve, then we can get the camera on you. I'll have that be the spot, because I think we can get that spot on camera. Don't, don't sit on my glasses. Oh, All right. man. <laughs> that, something you said uh, spurred this thought, and it's, I think this might apply to everybody. Not liking what you see about yourself and not dressing it won't make it go away. In fact, I think it makes it only magnifies it until you address the issue. Okay, so that paraphrase is almost what I said when I said you got to own it, right? Own it, fix it, address it. You can't ignore it. Look, I'm going to use maybe an interesting example. If you are a smoker or if you know people that are smokers, you know that you could smell them five feet away even if they can't smell them. So just because you don't realize you stink, believe me, everybody around you knows you stink. In other words, if you don't address something that needs to be addressed, others are going to know whether you want to address it or not. Because whatever it is that you haven't addressed is going to eventually extend beyond you and affect other people and be seen and understood by other people. Just like that person, because their senses have been dulled by the cigarette smoke where they don't even smell it anymore. But you smell it when they're a few feet away from you if you're not a smoker, right? Well, it's the same thing. Whatever area of your life that you're not addressing... Others see it. It's obvious they know it. It's there if it's been going on long enough. And you're just ignoring it and acting like, what are you talking about? I don't know. Because you've been numbed. Like your senses have been dulled in that area. And so that's why it's good to have a good friend who's willing to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Or someone who's a counselor that can give you that kind of counsel. All right, Janet. Is it on? Okay. <laughs> What's his fault? No, Rabbi, uh, you were talking about the Yetzahara. Yetzahara, is that how you say it? Yetzahara, yes. Yetzahara, yeah. You're saying the, the evil intent, right? And I was thinking about what you later on said about how either he allows it or he causes it. So when he created us, I felt, well, he created us with that intrinsic evil, whatever intent. And so there is a purpose to that. And you're saying, well, it's either you cause the evil or somebody else is causing the evil. And so it's almost, to me, like what, how I understood it is, well, sometimes we may be blind of our, the evil that we're causing because we all have those blind spots, but we can, we can still have the suffering created by somebody else. And so that should give us the understanding and the compassion that as they're, as we're, as they're struggling, we're struggling. So we're all struggling with this evil, and there is a purpose to it. And I, I think that the, I think that we really need to be very, in my case, like this happened literally this week, like we, we really need to be very aware of whenever somebody's causing suffering to us, what, what are we, what is, what is Abba trying to work on us by allowing that, you know, and that's, 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 that's maturity, that's growth, and that's what we should be doing. Thank Amen. You. Amen. Okay, and again, I would rather use the word inclination for that because yetzer, uh, the yetzer hara versus the yetzer hatov, it's not so much just the intent, okay? Because I talk about the ruach being the fullness of the intent, right? The spirit of something. But it's the inclination, the tendency towards, okay, as opposed to the intent, all right? So being inclined towards what is wrong and what you shouldn't be doing as opposed to being inclined towards what is good, and so it's a better way to look at it that way, okay? But yes, we should be always looking at the fact that, look, at some point, we're going to be in the millennium. And then after that, the kingdom. And I expect and pray and hope that everybody that I've ever met will be there. Whether they were in the world or whether they've been in this movement or in whatever walk, they've, that they will eventually be there. That they will figure it out, make the right choices, and be there. Now, that doesn't mean I necessarily want to be with them right now. Because right now, they may be dangerous to my walk because I may be drawn towards whatever they're doing that they shouldn't, that I shouldn't be doing or they shouldn't be doing. Not, not thinking for a second that they may not eventually, I'm hoping and I believe that they'll figure it out and fix it and be there anyway, right? But that doesn't, you see the difference? Where I am bubble popped, where they are maybe not bubble popped or partially whatever, 
may not be a good mix right now until we're both at the same place. And we're not going to all necessarily be there until the millennium and then into the kingdom. And so I, that's why I tell you, don't have negatives against anybody that's, you know, that's left here and had a problem with you. And, uh, or anybody in your life that's given you grief from wherever you were in a former affiliate, you know, whether it was a main, you know, some mainstream church, where it doesn't matter. It's his desire that all men be saved. Okay, that means that there should be a possibility for mostly that to work out. Even though we know it won't, but mostly it will. There will be those few that hopefully it's only a few that choose eventually not to. But that most will make the right choices when they understand the choices. And most of the people you've dealt with in your life have not had their bubble popped anyway, so they don't know what choices there are to make yet. And so that's, we don't judge them for that because the bubble popping isn't their choice. It's his choice, his timing. You didn't choose and said, bubble pop me right now. <laughs> Because I've had people of, in this room and others who've told me how when I was a certain age, I just wanted the truth, and then you ended up from nothing in some church. And you thought you had arrived. Well, but that wasn't really where you needed to be. But it was where you needed to be at that moment. It was part of your journey. And so wherever anybody is is part of their journey. As long as they ultimately get where they need to end up, that's fine. But would you want to be as concerned with how does it affect you? And what kind of influence does it have on you? So you don't judge them, but you use judgment to say, some people, not a problem. I can interact with them. They don't have any influence over me in any negative way. Other people, I might end up going a step backwards instead of continuing to go forward. And so then you have to make those decisions and those judgments. Okay, those are judgments, not judging. All right? All right, anybody else? Okay, good. All right, well, hopefully that was useful and good. Wait, oh, hold on, Grayson's got some on the stream. How many we got on there, by the way? He was not ready for that question. 207. 207, computer. From MTOI Philippines Jet, Rabbi Rosh Kodesh Shemayak, what's your message of encouragement for all MTOI leadership? Love you and thank you. Okay. The, okay, the message for all leadership, come to the meeting on July 10th. We'll share it. No. Jet, Jet's always at the meetings. My encouragement for all MTI leadership is you have to, more than anybody in the body, learn the vertical and walk the vertical and get the counsel and guidance and things that you need to in the right way. Because after all, any kind of leadership with people following, you need to know that they're only going to do at most what you do. Okay, at most, most of them won't do what even you do. So if you don't do, they're certainly not going to do. If you do wrong, that they'll imitate immediately. You all know this if you have children. That dumb thing that you did, they imitate it right away. The thing you want them to imitate and do right, no, no, that's, you've you got to beat them to get them to do that. Because that's just our evil inclination. <laughs> And so my encouragement to all of the MTY leadership, almost all of you are leadership in training. Own where you are. In other words, don't think you're higher than you are. Don't start to think you have more authority than you do. Don't think that you're not qualified to do more than you're qualified for. Own where you are and grow from that place and make sure that you're getting the counsel you need before you do things. The biggest problem people have in leadership is they run off and do things without asking. Okay? The only time you should ever go off and do something without asking is because it's something you've already asked and you already know the answer because you've already asked. So you don't have to ask each time you ask the same thing happens. You ask once, now you know what to do. And so my encouragement to the leadership is be patient. Don't try to overstep wherever it is that you are at the moment. Some of you are wonderfully stepping into the gap administratively to help you know, run from an administrative point of view, a small group somewhere, and some of you actually may have anointing and appointing. It has not been made clear yet who's who. So we'll be patient about that. So that's, that's my encouragement. Hang in there. You are appreciated for doing the work that you're doing, and there may be a lot more for you to do, or this may be what you have to do, but whatever it is, you're the person that was needed at the moment to step up and do something.
So we appreciate that, okay? The big encouragement, though, where I want to discourage you from is do not fall into a Korach moment. This Torah portion was for all of you in leadership. Not so much for everybody else, although it's for you too, but, I mean, it's especially for the leadership. If you are not content with where you are and what you're doing and what, to, uh, what you've been assigned to do, you could be having a Korach moment. We've had some of that recently. That's, so, that's why you end up with splits sometimes. You know, people are just wanting more than they're being given or they're not being given what they want fast enough. And those are all Korach moments. Of course, they will never admit that was what was happening and that's part of the Korach moment because <laughs> he wasn't going to admit he was having that problem either. But this is what it is, okay? I would say of the people in leadership type positions over the last 20 years that we've had that have left, it's a lot of it has been one or two was just disagreements with certain things I was teaching. That was way at the beginning. All the rest of it had nothing to do with teaching. It had to do with not being either enabled or entitled to do what they wanted to do in their position or wanting a position they didn't have. Those are all Korach moments. All right? And so that becomes the challenge. And part of that is, and this is for all the MQI leadership and all of you, if you're in an organization, you need to recognize that at some point, there's the top of the organization. Whatever it is. It could be a business. Top of the organization is the owner of the business. Okay? Or the president of the company or the board of directors, the CEO, you know, the board of directors. Whatever it is. The chairman of the board. Somebody has ultimate decision somewhere. Now, when you're in those positions, anywhere anybody else has to realize they, at the top, get to make decisions and they don't have to I don't want to use the right word. They are accountable in a different way than you are. In other words, they're accountable to you trusting in them. They're accountable to having those around them who they would hear, not necessarily listen to, but hear. You know there's a difference, right? Listening means I'm going to hear what you say and do it. Hearing means I'm going to hear what you say and I'm going to consider it. Now, you, in the vertical structure, if you're not the top person, then you are accountable to the person above you, as well as maybe people with you and the people that you're serving. Because that comes up, too. People want to say, well, Rabbi's not accountable to anybody. Well, who am I supposed to be accountable to? I'm not saying that in a flippant way. I'm the top of this organization. So I'm accountable in a different way. We have these leader meetings with 27 leaders every month. And they're all free to say anything they want. If they're like, Rabbi, you are just way off, they can, they're free to say it anytime and have any issue and bring it up. Okay? And yet, some people say, but you don't have any accountability. No, because there's, there's nobody physically above me in this group. I'm the founder. I'm the Nasi. I'm the leader of the group. But that doesn't mean there isn't any accountability. Trust me when I tell you, I picked Billy as an elder for a lot of reasons. And one of them is because I know he will walk right in my office and say, what in the world are you doing? <laughs> now, he hasn't ever done that because we haven't had that problem. And I know he would. Now, of course, he comes in sometimes laughing his head off saying, what in the hell are you doing? Because he knows he can't believe I did something so funny. He's like, well, what in the... <laughs> But then he's laughing. He's like, Rabbi, he's like, you just do stuff nobody does. But he, I know, would never hold back. Okay? And so that's important. And so you need to know that. So it's a good question that Jet's asking. Same thing with Rabbi Tom. Okay? I know he would say something if there was something to say. I've not put any shackles on anybody. Matter of fact, everybody that's ever worked here has been free to say something. The problem is most of them would just never said it. We, we begged and pleaded with them to say things that they wouldn't say. Billy's doing like this. He said, I begged them to come and sit with you, Rabbi. I know. And so then they're the same one saying, I don't have any accountability. But if you're not willing to come and talk, how do I have any accountability? Even on that different form of accountability. You've got to be willing to come and talk, Right? Oh, but what, if, but what if I come and talk and then you show me that I was wrong? Well, then that's possible, isn't it? 
And then you have to be willing to do that. If you're going to go, when Korach went to Moses, he had to be willing to have Moses come crack right back down and say, well, that's fine. You go get your fire holder and we'll go see who Yahweh anointed. Okay? Man, I'd love to use that. <laughs> I don't want the ground swallowing anybody up, but I certainly would like to have somewhere say, let's see if Yahweh would please endorse who actually is anointed. And by the way, you don't see any of these people putting teachings out anywhere to show their anointing. Where, where is it? Well, but people like them better. Well, fine. Go find likable people. I don't know how fast that's going to get you to change from what you are to what he is, but you'll have more fun, I guess. And I seriously don't think that Moses, Paul, some of these other guys were all that likable necessarily from that same measuring stick. Okay? And I think I'm a pretty likable guy anyway. Okay? You know. I just, very blunt. I'm just very blunt. You know, it's like poor persons found out they've got cancer and they're all afraid they're going to die and I walk in and tell them, let's just stop that right now. You are dying. What? And Billy looked at me like, how could you just come in here and tell this lady she's dying? <laughs> and you know what? She laughed. And it, it broke the cycle of where she was. Okay? And that's the blunt instrument that can be good if you allow it. And she certainly could have hung up and said, that was the meanest, rudest thing, and that rabbi and just told everybody what a jerk I was. But instead she listened and I helped her understand, this is your challenge right now, and you may or may not end up dying from it, but we're all dying, and nobody knows when that's actually going to happen. I mean, this is not a, you know. Look, Rabbi Tom never expected to get to where he is right now. Except I told him he wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> he had one surgery. He's like, Rabbi, I don't think I'm coming out of this. I said, no, no, you'll be coming out of this. And actually, when I met him, I don't think he would have made it this far if he hadn't made the changes in his life that he's made. But then he made a bunch of changes. So you don't know. You may die sooner than you think or live longer than you think. It's not relevant, really. What are you doing with whatever time you have? That's what's relevant. Okay? So my encouragement to the leadership that, that was really what started all this from Jet was understand the limited role you have, do it to the best of your ability, and then maybe Abba might have more for you to do. Amen? All right? Okay, and trust me when I tell you, and Billy and I talk about this all the time, if you really understood the job, not just the stuff we jokingly whine about in front of you, but like the burden of responsibility, the questions that are asked that people really need answers to, and then when we give them, they're trusting them. This is a tough job. If you take it seriously, if you're just going to flippantly throw stuff out there and not care whether or not it helps or hurts, that's one thing. But there's, every time I talk to the leadership, and this is for Jet and the other leaders, you're not in charge of anything. You have the burden of responsibility to make decisions. You hear the difference in that? I'm in charge, or I have the burden, and it is a burden to make decisions. So for MTOI, I have that burden. We do, that, by the way, that leadership council never votes on anything, in case you were wondering. But here's the good news. I'm not a hireling. Nobody can fire me. Nobody can make me say or not say. You do not want a hireling. Okay? Well, you might think you want it because then the hireling will do what you want, but you will get nowhere with a hireling. You'll get that ear tickling, you know, smooth words, etc. Or you'll be doing, turning them over on a regular basis like they do in some of the churches. You know, I remember when, when I was, we were sharing a building with the Baptist church, we were using their gym, and the pastor basically said to me, you know what, when you walk in, it's almost like they say to you, hey, we fired the last 37 people, if you don't stay in line, we'll fire you too. Because he was a hireling. And I said to him, why do you take that? Stop being a hireling. Lead them or go find a different ministry where you can lead. Why? Because <laughs> he was miserable. 
I said, of course you're miserable because you're not a leader. You're a hireling. How could that be good as a leader? You're supposed to lead, but you can't lead. Okay? I want you to go ahead and put, you know, paint this wall, but I'm going to tie both your hands behind your back, and I'm going to tie your legs up too so you can't even walk. That's basically what he's being told. Paint the wall, and you can't even move. So, of course, that's frustrating. So you should, you should want whatever leadership you have to be without restraint in that way. Because you know what? Your favorite teachings would never have gotten taught. Because nobody would have ever allowed a teacher to teach those things. Okay? Can you imagine as a hireling, I went up to whoever the leadership was and said, I want to teach Beware False Prophets. Yeah, that would have gone over really well. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go watch the teaching. Or what about, what about the teaching showing that once saved, always saved doesn't work necessarily in Scripture? No, that wouldn't have worked. Or what about that grace isn't what we all thought it was? Oh, though, oh yes, that's exciting. Go teach that. that. No way. What about the teaching on covenant to actually know what our relationship should be and is supposed to be? See, I don't have any shackles. Some of you don't like that, but you, you forget how much you benefit from it. Because the word goes around, well, who are you accountable to? Him. The one who put me here. You didn't put me here. You're sitting here because he put you here. There's a difference. Okay? You didn't put me here, but he put you here, okay? And you got to ask yourself, well, then why is that? Because is there anybody in the room that actually lived in Tennessee bef before, I, before you started with this ministry? Okay, three people, all right? And two of them are related. <laughs> There's really two families. All the rest of you were put here. So where does that make a difference and to what degree? Okay. Now, I was put here first so that this would be here for you to come to. That part was true. But you know what? The congregation you originally gave me, not a single one of them is still here. But they were here to get this started. Just like the 603,550 that died in the desert, or 548. Because <laughs> two of them made it. They were there to be enough to get them started and get that part of the journey done. Look, Rabbi Tom's here because the guy who kind of recommended him here started here. He isn't here anymore. But that guy was here long enough to recommend Rabbi Tom to check out this ministry. And that was the connecting point. And some of you are here because people that are not here anymore connected you here. And then they left. They served a purpose, though, didn't they? Hopefully they'll serve more in other ways. But let's get this clear and right. See, we're not used to true vertical. We're not used to true authority. We're not used to trusting that authority that it's, because we want to have a say. Everybody wants to have a say. But Rabbi, we don't like the way you do this, that, and that. That's fine, but you don't get a vote. And then people don't like when I say that. I said, because voting is counterproductive and will eventually get you what you see in the world today. Because the world ends up liberal. And I'm not talking about from a political point of view. I mean, just more and more anything goes. Okay, we're using it from the, that general term of liberal, right? Unrestrained. That's what you get when there's voting. <laughs> okay, so you don't want that. You don't want that. You want the leadership free. Now, by the way, if you ask, and you should, and you can, talk to Elder Billy, talk to Rabbi Tom, they'll tell you, I take counsel, I share information, I ask questions about opinions before I make decisions. I'm not just sitting in some ivory tower somewhere just, like, dictating things, okay? 
And so you need to know that. Because in the abundance of counsel is wisdom. And I may already know what I want to do and think I should do, but I'm going to check and see what other people think first. I speak to my wife. I speak to the eldership. I speak to the, maybe the whole leader meeting. We'll do this. On, a lot of times I talk to the leaders. And it's for two reasons. One is to test them to see where their heads are at, especially if I already know what I want to do and I think I'm, I'm like really positive what I want to do. But I want to see where they are. Are they on the same page? Are we on different pages? Do I have to do something to bring us to consensus? Or perhaps somebody will say something I just absolutely missed somewhere and will make all the difference. Because one thing that Billy will also tell you is, I'm not sort of this, you know, steel trap mind where I just snap close and then that, that's it. I'm always open to consider that I might have missed something. Okay? Oh, the leaders are all volunteers too, yeah. And I'm willing to listen to volunteers and take their input. The best part, though, is that ultimately they're willing to listen when I speak as well. And that's also something you'd want, because otherwise you'd have just chaos. All right? All right, see, Jet, what you caused? See what you started? All right, Grayson. All the other questions you answered in an in, in, in focus that I believe Shamash Gary linked in the chat. Okay, good. All right, fantastic. All right, well, that's going to wrap it up then. All right, I guess I'll come out here and we'll do the Rosh Kodesh wave goodbye thing from out here. So if you all rise, if you want to be off camera, go that way. <laughs> all right, so. And wait for Rabbi Tom to come on over. You come right in front. There you go. All right, so we're going to look at this camera over here. We want everybody out there to receive our blessings in Rosh Chodesh Sameach. So we're wishing them a good month. So we're going to wish them all Rosh Chodesh Sameach. We're going to say Shavuot Tov, have a good week. And we're going to tell them that we love them. On three. One, two, three.